Okay, let's try this again. All right, it sounds like it's working. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today is our first negotiations town hall, and we plan on doing many more of these. And we wanna keep you updated throughout our entire process, and this is one of our best ways to keep you updated. Before we get started today, we're gonna to go around the room and also on the screen and introduce everyone that's here um, answering the question, or not answering the questions today, talking today. First off, I'm Julie Hedrick. I'm the APFA National President. Josh? Good morning, everyone. I'm Josh Black. I'm APFA National Secretary. Glad to have you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Timothy Lagaros, APFA Negotiator, uh, based in Miami, 20 years. I'm Sarah Corrigan. I'm based in Philadelphia. I'm an APFA Negotiator, and I've been flying for 21 years. Susan Roble. I'm the current base president for Chicago. I've been flying for 35 years. I'm Chip Patel, DFW base, uh, contract action team. Wendy Oswald, Los Angeles based, negotiator. I've been flying for 26 years. I'm Brian Morgan. I'm based in Philadelphia. I've been flying for 28 years and one of the negotiators. Hey everybody, I'm Joe Burns. I'm the lead in negotiating attorney who's uh, working with your negotiating committee. Um, I've been, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself later. Okay. <laughs> we also have Kelly. Kelly, you want to introduce yourself? Hi guys, I'm Kelly Hagan. I'm on the negotiating committee. I've been flying for American for about eight years and I'm based in Chicago. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks Kelly and Deb. Deb? She's on mute. Deb, you're on mute. Okay, let's continue on. Okay, we also have Deb Volpe. Uh, it sounds like we're having a little technical difficulty uh, with her mic, and she's on today with us, and uh, she is part of the contract action team. Okay, well, the, fir the format for this town hall is a little bit different than we've done in our other previous town halls. Um, today, we're not taking questions and we have the chat feature turned off. That's because primarily this town hall is for us to talk to you and to let you know where we're at in the process, our strategy for this, and um, about our um, contract action team. So we're gonna get started right off the bat with Joe uh, talking about the strategy for these negotiations. Hey everybody, um, so uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of my background and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, our bargaining here and specifically the framework of our bargaining, which is strategic bargaining. Um, I've been, a, I'm an attorney, but I've been uh, bargaining in the airline industry for over 20 years. Um, I have worked on uh, pretty much most contracts in the industry. I've worked on the United uh, Joint Contract. I've worked on Alaska, Hawaiian, Spirit, uh, a wide variety of regional carriers, charter carriers, and so forth. Um, specifically here, uh, I have worked on the America West contract, uh, worked on the uh, US Airways contract, the joint contract at US Airways, and also the uh, joint contract uh, with uh, uh, US Airways and American that produced your current contract. Um, so I have a w wide variety of uh, experience in the airline industry, um, bargaining management, and also the team that we're up against, uh, which is uh, uh, the American management, uh, which is led by Cindy Simone and Jerry Glass. Um, my role is to assist your committee uh, in uh, negotiations, uh, which involves helping them draft language, uh, speaking at the table, and uh, you know overall strategy. But you know they're your flight attendant committee; they make all the decisions on proposals. Um, but uh, you know I think we work together as a team to uh, argue uh, to win proposals for y'all. So um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about sort of the framework of bargaining because that's a obviously important issue. Um, we, we need to be very intentional 
and strategic about uh, how we engage in bargaining. And certainly our adversaries, the, the employers, are, are very strategic about their approach to bargaining. And I'm gonna talk just really, really briefly about kind of a, you know, sort of an older way of bargaining that uh, a lot of uh, unions uh, in the airline industry and other industries fell into, um, which we're specifically breaking away from. And that was a, a style of negotiations that involved a lot of you know, really the focus was just what went on at the bargaining table. The committee would get together. Um, they would put together a laundry list of proposals, not a ton of strategy about how many proposals they were bringing in or how long the negotiations should last. And then they would go away and argue their case with the company. Uh, typically, they would not provide a ton of information to the membership. Um, they would, they might tell you they were negotiating what section they were negotiating on, but really didn't uh, pull the members uh, that much into the process. Um, years later, you know, because sometimes days turn into months, months turn into years, and often these negotiations would go on for, you know, three, four, five years at the same time while the flight attendants are stuck at your, your old wage rates. Um, and then they would come out with a tentative agreement. No one would know what was in it. And then, you know, there'd be a process of explaining it to the membership. So that's kind of the old way. And we're not doing that. So we've kind of specifically talked about with your negotiated committee, um, with your board of directors, about an approach to negotiations, which we're uh, discussing as uh, strategic bargaining. And, you know, strategic bargaining, um, really, as the name indicates, is every aspect of our negotiations is based on strategy and based on sort of intentional decisions about how we're going to drive the negotiations forward to win the best contract for the flight attendant group here at American Airlines. Um, the first uh, element of strategic bargaining is uh, engaging in a process where you take control of the bargaining. Um, that means you're very conscious and intentional about how long do you want the negotiations to go on. You know, obviously, under the Railway Labor Act, and we'll talk about that a bit more later, um, there's great advantages for the company who wants to delay, delay, delay negotiations. They like negotiations which go on for years uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is uh, they don't have to pay any wage increases or make any improvements during that period. They don't have to deal with your issues. So the longer they can drag out negotiations, uh, the more they can continue with the uh, status quo. Um, so, so in a strategic bargaining approach, um, we really sit down and at the get-go, we kind of uh, really scrutinize it and say, you know, what sections are the priorities for the flight attendants? What are the priority issues for the flight attendants? And develop the sort of number of proposals and the number of sections that we're negotiating uh, in order to uh, focus on priorities and not let management sort of uh, drive us into the weeds on the peripheral sections. So that's very much uh, an element uh, of this contract negotiations. And we'll be talking with you as we proceed. Uh, about you know how we develop those proposals and what that looks like. Um, the second element of strategic bargaining is uh, providing information to the flight attendant group. This is your contract, um, and you know we have the philosophy that you should know what's going on in the bargaining and get details about what's actually uh, happening in the bargaining. And equally important, um, management, you know, often is the one who likes to have things done. Uh, you know, they, they don't like things to be public. If they put out a proposal and they're not giving you the rest they want, they'd rather have that discussed behind closed doors rather than, you know, having the daylight shine on it and have to answer to 27,000 flight attendants. So part of our power here in bargaining uh, comes from uh, letting management know what's going on in bargaining. If management, uh, you know, is, is uh, not dealing with our issues, then you're going to hear about it, and you're going to be part of the process of, uh, of getting your agreement. 
So what this concretely means is as we go through negotiations, today your negotiating committee is going to give you sort of the highlights of each section that we're talking about with the company so you know what's going on at the bargaining table. We're going to have periodic updates where we'll do side-by-sides that will explain where's the company's overall position, where's the union's position, and, and basically involve you at every step of the process. So doing that, um, you know, as I've stated, really puts them on the defensive, but it also does another thing which uh, brings the membership into negotiations. So I've, I've been negotiating, you know, countless, you know, days and hours and months uh, at the bargaining table, pretty much what I've done for the last uh, several decades. And, you know, a lot of people think bargaining is just about you sit down at the table and you convince the company to agree to this or that. And we do a lot of that. We make our arguments. We have our statistics. We have our reasons why they should agree to stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, management's driven by their shareholders and they're driven by the bottom line. And when we fight for more rest, when we fight for, um, you know, uh, crew rest, whatever we fight for, uh, the hotel issues, uh, the company is looking at it in terms of productivity. Um, they're looking at it in terms of the bottom lines, what it increases the cost of the company. So we really, really negotiations is part of a process where we're trying to get more and they're trying to give us less. So just mere words cannot resolve those issues. It's really about power. So strategic negotiations is based on the concept that the greatest power we have in bargaining is that we have 27,000 members. And if we get the membership, which we totally can, uh, engaged in the process, then great things can happen. And I know this because, you know, it's happened at countless carriers that we've worked on. Um, you know, just a year ago, worked on the Hawaiian contract where management was dragging out negotiations. Uh, the Hawaiian flight attendants over the years have built a great contract. Management was trying to ship, chip away at it, take away their staffing language, which they still had, their health care and so forth. And it was a huge fight. But you know what we did? We went to the flight attendants. We took a strike vote. We started picketing every month. We got a 2200 to 1 strike vote um, in favor of a strike. Um, we took that to the company. We did um, monthly picketing, really militant. And guess what? Right before the pandemic, the Hawaiian flight attendants got a deal. Frontier, I could go through a whole list of carriers where this basic strategy has worked. Um, but it's going to be fundamental to our bargaining uh, and uh, Deb and Ankit are going to talk to you later, but in many ways, your involvement is the most important part of bargaining. I mean, all of our work we do at the table is critical. Like, you've got to be smart in bargaining and, and take on the company at the bargaining table, but we need the membership to, you know, be involved, and it's going to start off. I'm not going to, you know, go into a ton of TDL about it uh, uh, and leave that for Deb and Ankit, but we're going to start out, you know, you start out with smaller actions and it's important to participate in them because we build up and up and up uh, to whatever it uh, takes uh, to get the contract that uh, uh, you all uh, deserve. So anyway, those are, um, you know, sort of general concepts about our, our framework of bargaining. Uh, I think we're excited to be back to the bargaining table uh, and, uh, you know, excited to, you know, have a a powerful framework that's going to, you know, that we're going to take on the company and, and, and get the, the provisions that flight attendants uh, need. So anyway, I'm excited to be working with you all and uh, I'll turn it back to Julie. Thanks, Joe. And we're excited you're here to say the least. Um, it has, let's see, this uh, negotiation started back in 2019 and one of the questions we've had, we paused it through COVID, but one of the questions we've had from a lot of flight attendants is, why are we going back to the table now? And we've had some concerns about what COVID has done to the industry and concerns about us going back to the table. Um, Joe, I know that, you know, we're not the only carrier going back to the table. Uh, our pilots, APA, they're already back at the table. United is going back to the table soon. Um, it, you know, spirit is at the table. I think I saw today American Eagle Piedmont is actually already taking a strike vote. So the industry, everyone is getting back to the table at this time. 
And where we are at as far as American Airlines and the industry today is in a very different position because of the unions, because of what all of us have done with PSP and making sure that our airline and our industry survived. It's time for us to get back to the table. Um, is there anything else I'm missing here as far as, you know, the other other carriers out there and why we're back today? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right, Julie. Um, so when COVID hit, when you look throughout the industry, um, there were a lot of negotiations going on, but there were also, you know, a whole wave of bargaining that was coming up. And what you saw pretty much across the board is most unions uh, opted to take a pause in their bargaining. Um, a lot of folks were dealing with, you know, a lot of issues related to COVID and, uh, and how to uh, survive that period. But also most folks understood that that wasn't really uh, an appropriate time to be at the bargaining table. We didn't know where things were going to go financially. We didn't know um, whether or not carriers were going to be going into bankruptcy. So we didn't really want to give uh, management an opportunity to take away uh, items and use, management likes to use crises as, as, a, as, a, as, as a tool uh, to get their way. And we didn't want to let them do that. So, so you know, you, you look across the industry, pilots, the customer service agents, um, most of the carriers at, at, at AFA, um, uh, you know, opted to, uh, uh, to either um, pause their bargaining or to, uh, you know, instead where they had early openers, uh, not exercise them. So for example, United, um, Spirit and so forth. Uh, and that was pretty much about throughout the industry. So then you get to, you know, sort of uh, the spring and summer exactly when we were having these discussions and what you saw is people returning to the bargaining table. And that's reflective of the fact that the industry is picking up in, over the summer, as you all know, um, flights are a lot fuller. So folks, uh, you know, I think throughout the industry uh, decided to get back to the bargaining table because it, it, it makes sense. And you don't want to, you know, delay it a, you know, a year or two more and then be in a position where, you know, the, the there's a, you know, a, a healthy rebound, but you're still stuck bargaining back uh, when you could have been making up some time. And we're already two and a half years in, right? We started back in early 2019. Our last raise was January of 2019 at the last contract. So it, it was good time and it's time to be back. Well, we met in August um, with the company, continued the discussions that had ended in 2019, only now, as you've heard, we met with a different strategy. Uh, we added two more TAs uh, the last time we met, but we had a lot of discussions about a lot of our open sections. And we really feel like we'll be meeting again next week with the company, and we feel like we'll be able to close out a lot of those sections next week. One of the most important things for the membership right now is to make sure you stay informed. And uh, we have put out so far uh, four negotiation hotlines. And if you're not signed up for our hotlines, it's really important that you sign up with APFA for the hotlines. That's how, part of the process of keeping you informed. As I said, we'll also have more town halls to keep you informed. The rest of the town halls will be more of a Q&A type town hall like we've normally done. Uh, so you'll see that in the next town halls that come. But it's really important that you stay informed and you stay engaged. So please make sure if you're not signed up that you get signed up. We're also doing an upgrade to our website. Uh, it should be, it will look entirely different. We hope that'll be done in the next month, right, Josh? Correct. <laughs> Josh is shaking his head. Uh, we've got quite a few people working on it right now. And the nice thing about it is, is we'll have a negotiation tab at the top. It'll be really easy to find the information. We want to make sure you don't have to go dig for that information, that you don't have to go look back at old hotlines to see, you know, try and find those and see where we're at. And we want to make it really easy to, for you to stay informed and to stay engaged. All right, so we're going to move on and we're going to talk a little bit about the actual Section 6 process uh, that we are in for negotiations. And I know Brian Morgan is going to start it off with, us off with this. And since Joe's had over 20 years, um, of negotiations. He's going to uh, take it 
uh, a part of this also. So Brian, why don't you get us started with that? Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here with us today. Um, a little information on where we are. Um, we're under Section 6 negotiation, uh, which for some of us um, is a completely different uh, uh, avenue than what, what we may have been used to. Um, a little background on Section 6. Um, Section 6 is actually a portion of the Railway Labor Act. Uh, the Railway Labor Act was passed back in uh, to federal law in 1926. Uh, Ten years later, in 1936, the amendment was added to include the airline industry. Um, from that point, uh, we started off with, um, in 2018, in the fall of 2018, we started to prep for negotiations. Um, it was an early opener. Um, and as Julie noted, in 2019, very early in 2019, um, we initiated our um, section openers with the uh, management and started moving forward with section six discussions. Um, our current position right now is where we are is that we are in direct negotiations with uh, management going forward. Um, sections that are uh, currently open, uh, which we will be discussing with you, as Julie had noted, there are several items that we'll bring up a few, uh, in a few minutes to talk about on where we are in that process. Um, section six, um, we, on both sides of the company, you can present, um, you know, your sections, what, what items are important to you. And as Joe has pointed out, um, we've, we've begun a, a different approach to that in, in this regard. Um, as we move through the, the Section 6 process, um, we, as you can see on the chart that's on the screen in front of you, um, there is a um, sort of like a time uh, format that, or not time, but a, a process format that we follow um, in regards to that. I'm actually going to turn this portion of the um, conversation over to Joe at this stage as we moved out, uh, or if, if should we move beyond the direct negotiations and what that process will look like. Uh, okay, thanks, Brian. Um, so the the process of negotiations um, for uh, railroad and airline workers is governed by the Railway Labor Act, as uh, Brian uh, indicated. And um, this process is, you know, it, it's a very government regulated process um, for the simple reason that uh, airline and railroad workers have incredible power uh, in this economy. When you think about it, you're the ones who, you know, make the national economy function. Um, so there's a concern on the part of the employers uh, and the government that they want to regulate our strike activity. So that's kind of the sort of underlying sort of philosophy there with the Railway Labor Act, but it also gives us a lot of leverage and opportunities uh, to uh, organize and so forth. I won't go into this in detail uh, because I'd be talking for an hour. Um, but. So anyway, so the process is right now we're under direct negotiations. That's where the union and the company, they don't have the federal government involved. There's no mediator. We're just meeting. We're setting our times with the company exchanging proposals. Um, and, you know, that can, you know, go on. It goes on until it doesn't work anymore. Um, and that's in most negotiations, you read a, reach a point where the company is dragging their feet. You're not making progress. You're getting to difficult economic issues. So the Railway Labor Act provides that either party, the company or the union, uh, or jointly even, um, can request the assistance of the National Mediation Board. Um, so you notify the Mediation Board, fill out your paperwork, and they assign a mediator. Um, and the mediator, they're, you know, uh, you know, former union officials, former company officials who are um, federal government employees who work for the National Mediation Board, one gets assigned to you, and from that point forward, um, they're in control of the negotiations in terms of they're the ones who determine when and where you meet um, and, you know, have, you know, some control over the process. They have no authority to tell you what to do. They can't make management agree to a proposal. They can't make the union agree to the proposal, but they can, uh, you know, sort of influence the outcome. So you engage in mediation with the company, and most negotiations end up in mediation. Um, uh, and at a certain point, let's say you're mediating and you're, you get to a point where things just ain't happening, you're not getting to a deal. Um, you know, typically we're the ones getting frustrated because we want improvements, management's dragging our feet. So we, uh, we say we want to move the process forward. 
And typically what we do is we write the National Mediation Board and say, hey, we want to release. We want to be released into a 30-day cooling off period, <coughs> excuse me, into a 30-day cooling off period, um, which ultimately would lead us to be able to strike at the end of it. Um, so uh, technically what happens is if the board decides to grant that, which they don't have to, um, they issue what's called a proffer of arbitration where they say, hey, both parties were willing to arbitrate the dispute. Um, that's routinely turned down because, uh, you know, the union, uh, you know, typically doesn't want to give away the power and the right of the members to decide um, on your contract, which is what, hap what would happen in that case. Um, so, uh, so that's usually rejected. If it's rejected, you go into a 30-day cooling off period. Um, and you, you, folks have been around a, a while, um, you know, at, at, all, at all of the pre-merger carriers know what that is, right? Because you, you would have done it at a, a American uh, back in the 90s with your strike. America West went to the 30-day cooling off period and they got a contract at the end of it. U.S. Airways in 99 goes to the end of a 30-day cooling off period. It's super intense, a lot of bargaining, but that's usually a lot of times back in the day where you would reach deals. Um, because the pressure of the deadline and super mediation, you got the mediation board involved. So you can reach a deal there. If you don't, at the end of the 30 day cooling off period, uh, basically the gloves are off. Um, it's what's called the self help period. Um, for the union, that means you can uh, engage in uh, strike activity. Um, for the comp And you can't do it before that. That's, we'll talk about that as we proceed. You can't uh, jump the gun. Um, and for the company, that means that the company can implement their version of self-help. They could implement the proposal. Let's say they were trying to cut health care. They get to, you know, they get to implement proposals that they had proposed in bargaining. And sometimes that happens. They can do a lockout. Um, they've got tools in, in their thing, but they think the overall concept is the pressure of that on both sides is often uh, how you would reach an agreement. Um, there's one little caveat. Um, the, the president could appoint a presidential uh, emergency board, uh, as happened in the uh, 95 strike, three, uh, three strike. <laughs> um, the board hearing was, like, I think, in 95. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, that could happen. If that does, it, it, it delays things. It doesn't stop it forever. Um, it, it ends up being the total amount it gets delayed will be about 60 days. Um, uh, uh, 30 for the decision and the 30 days after that. Um, uh, but then after that, you're back into self-help mode. So that is, in a nutshell, a quick version of the Railway Labor Act and Section 6 bargaining. Yep. Thank you very much for that. We have a lot of flight attendants on the property who have never been through negotiations. You know, since if you think about it, since the JCBA, we've hired 6,500, you know, flight attendants. So. This is the first negotiations we have for a lot of our flight attendants. We also will have a video going out uh, on the website that will also walk everyone through the Section 6 uh, process. So thank you. We just wanted to make sure we added that in. Everybody realize we are in Section 6 negotiations. Okay, so um, we mentioned that we met in August and that there were some negotiations that were going on back in 2019. At this point, we have eight sections of the contract that we have reached tentative agreements on. Uh, I believe Josh is showing that on the screen at this time. Uh, with these sections, there have been very little changes to these sections, and a lot of them we've updated the current processes. Uh, some of the sections that were uh, carried over from previous contracts they needed updating with the um, with really the new tools that we have uh, that we use today in our bidding processes and also in our, our other systems. So uh, we have seen that uh, in these kind of agreements, we will have bullet points out for everyone uh, and we'll add those to our new negotiations page uh, soon. So we're going to move on to the sections that are open at this time and that we'll be talking about this next week when we meet uh, with management. And uh, first, we're going to start with uh, Section 6, which is our crew accommodation section, one of our most important sections that we've 
really um, had some struggles in the last year with, and uh, Tim Legaros is going to walk us through where we're at with this. Yeah, so Section 6 uh, covers crew accommodations, which is hotels and transportation, which we all know how important hotels, having a hotel and transportation is to our flight ascends and adequate rest. Um, the company has a basic obli obligation to secure us hotels and transportation. They do that automatically. It's done in the bid packets for those se sequences that are scheduled. That is pretty much running like it should. The biggest problem we're seeing, and we're seeing it quite a lot, is with IROPs or regular operations, weather events, rescheduling, which has gotten out of control. Um, we're getting reports of flight events waiting on hold with scheduling for 30 minutes, an hour, up to several hours having no hotels when they land, waiting several hours for hotels, uh, some crews sleeping in airports, on the plane, in lobbies, which is completely unacceptable. Um, so we are definitely looking to secure some language uh, to, to fix the problem. In addition, for when those incidents happen, that there's a penalty imposed so that the, the flight attendants are compensated. Um, time is money. Management certainly wouldn't sit around on hold for three hours waiting for someone to pick up the phone or three hours or four hours or six hours for a hotel room, so why should we? Um, we're also looking into a hotel buyback program similar to other airlines where if you cancel your hotel room, there would be some money put given back to the flight attendant. There's a cost savings by canceling your hotel room. There's no reason why that money shouldn't be shared with the flight attendant who's not using the room. Um, in the meantime, we still have issues going on, rescheduling and flight attendants reporting they're not having hotel rooms when they land or in a timely fashion. Um, until we do secure language, until this contract is ratified and all of that, please continue to write up your issues. You can do that on the hotel page of the APFA website by choosing the hotel debrief form or by emailing to hotels at APFA.org. Thanks, Tim. I, I know everyone knows how big of an issue this has been for us this past year. And um, I know there, we have an approach to what we are trying to do here, and I know Joe's going to talk about that a little bit. <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, you know, obviously, we, you know, I think everyone understands that the hotels is an urgent issue to deal with. Um, when we've talked about it, we've talked about having a three-pronged approach to dealing with the problem. Uh, the first prong was... Um, uh, getting this to the attention of uh, top management in the company and the APA, which is the pilots union and APFA, uh, both on the same day filed uh, presidential grievances um, demanding that the company take immediate steps to resolve this problem. You know, obviously we're dealing with it in bargaining, but we're not waiting for a contract uh, for flight attendants to get the hotels they deserve. Um, the second approach is that, uh, as uh, Tim talked about, uh, we have bargaining, we're, we're, we're bargaining language because even if they fix it now, because they're getting a lot of pressure, um, we need permanent, uh, a permanent solution to the problem and a commitment that flight attendants are going to get hotels when they deserve them. Or they deserve them all the time. Anytime you're on an unscheduled layover or, or uh, any sort of uh, any situation where you're out of base, you, you need your hotel promptly. So that's uh, the, the second prong is uh, our bargaining strategy. And the third prong goes back to what we talked about before, um, which is uh, membership involvement and, and activation. So um, throughout the negotiations, uh, if there's, uh, you know, important issues that, that we need to deal with, we're not going to wait to the end of negotiations when we're picketing and so forth. Um, we're going to pull the members in, into that. And this is an issue that we really need everybody to help with. Um, and so we have a, a campaign that we're launching today uh, that uh, do you want right to talk now, about, Julie? I, I sure will. That our first contract action item was sent out at 1.30 Central Time today to all of you that received the hotlines. And in that email, there is a link, and it's talking about this is a link to David Seymour to let him know how important it is to you that you get the rest you deserve on a layover, that we should not be waiting for an hour, two hours, three hours, or more to get a, a hotel room, that we need a hotel room, we need transportation to our hotels, and the company needs to make sure that that happens. So 
That email went out today at 1.30. We need all of you to press on the link, tell every flight attendant that you are working with to fill it out and to make sure that you send that email off to David Seymour and let him know how important it is that we get the rest that we deserve on our layovers. I was just informed it's actually going out in 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Well, it was supposed to go out at 1.30, but it'll be going out in 15 minutes. So we're close. So be watching for that, okay. So, uh, all right, we're gonna move on to section seven, which is uniforms. Brian Morgan's going to talk a little bit about the uniforms, uh, where we're at with that uh, section today. Can I welcome everybody. Um, section seven um, under the uniform program uh, and the product that we have in there, just a few key points in that section that we're looking at. Um, as many of you know who have been on the property, in 2017, uh, we had our gray uniform come out um, and we had some dramatic issues uh, with that. Uh, 2019 introduced the current uniform, which is the blue uh, uniform and the new uniform product line. Um, we're looking to, uh, within that, um, when the blue line came out, um, through union uh, pressure, um, the company moved to take and accept the OCATECT program. Um, we're looking at trying to move and maintain um, OCATECT as required items or something similar to or holding the um, consistency of the safety and recognition that OCATECT carries globally um, throughout the contract, that which would apply to not only any alterations or changes to the current program, but all future programs going forward. Um, that would not only apply just to the product line, but also into the manufacturing and the facilities that uh, render our products to ensure that everything going forward um, maintains the level of safety that we, um, we look forward to and to ensure that our membership is protected through that. Um, another item in the, in the, that falls under um, uniform, um, our old manuals used, and many of us who, were, who have not been part of the electronic age, used to be paper. Um, and we had to carry them with us. Um, that language reflected that up until just recently um, when the manual was moved into the electronic age and is now part of the tablet. Um, the tablet uh, information, as many of you know now, uh, we're about to move, thank heavens, to the iPhone 12, uh, which will be coming out next year. Um, to everybody, um, so we'll uh, be moving forward to that. Um, but with those changes, there's an expense to that. Um, we just wanna make sure that um, in the language that we currently have that protected us under the manuals for damage and lost items, that our flight attendants are not impacted financially going forward um, should an item uh, or the tablet be damaged, lost, or stolen in that aspect. Um, if it is part of our working uh, requirements under the FARs to maintain and, and, and keep with us, um, so we, we want to make sure that we're not financially impacted on that and that some of the language reflect, reflects that to ensure that we're protected for those. Thanks, Brian. Sure. I think you covered that quite well. I think, you know, what we went through in 2017-18 uh, with the uniform, it's really important uh, that we have that in our contract so that that never happens again, right? That we right. always Absolutely. make sure the safety and the health of our flight attendants is our number one priority always. Um, also, I know everyone is looking forward to the iPhone 12. Uh, the tablets we have, we all know, are way out of date, to say the least, and have many problems with them. We definitely want to make sure that our flight attendants, if it's something happens to it or if it's lost, that it is, does not come out of their pocket. Thanks, Brian. Okay, uh, we're going to move on. Oh, to section 19. Okay, well, that's my section because... Uh, Section 19 is a section that uh, is open. It is a section that hadn't been used since 2000 and the early 2000s. I think it was around 2003. And as most of you know, we've used it extensively in the last month. Uh, it has kind of highlighted that we need to update this section quite a bit uh, with the systems, as I mentioned earlier, the systems we no longer have line bidding. We also have different types of systems that we use for open time. Craft today was primarily manned by all system seniority. We had, depending upon when the mission, the company was notified of the mission, some of those were done by base seniority. So right now I'd say the best thing about this is, is we have, we know how uh, it works for this 
recent missions, all the missions that we have, and I'm sure that uh, when we uh, close out this section, it will be very close to what was done today. So um, that's one of the sections I don't think we really ended, thought we were going to make a lot of changes to. And after uh, this last month, we realized it, it does need an update. Uh, all right, we're going to move on to section 27, IOD. And uh, Susan is going to help us out with that. Thank you, Julie. So current contractual language provides for pay continuance for six months for flight attendants. In our discussions with the Injury on Duty Department Chair, we found that many flight attendants don't feel that they're getting the full benefit in this language. Mainly those who are going out mid-month are coming back mid-month. So our proposal would change the six months to a daily rate, um, and the pay continuance would then be for 180 days. Great. I, I think that will help uh, simplify the process and make sure everyone is paid for every day um, that they are out on an IOD. Um, and, and we're also um, well aware that human odor events are affecting more flight attendants than ever. Many times these events are not approved as an injury on duty. We're proposing adding new language to the contract that would protect flight attendants in these instances so that those events would never become a, a chargeable occurrence in the current attendance policy. I think that's very important. It is very important. We, we're seeing more and more of the fume events happening on our aircraft every day. So we really, this is really important language for our flight attendants. And lastly, we're proposing an extension to the length of time that a flight attendant would be eligible for active uh, rate insurance following uh, the injury on duty. Susan. Okay, we're moving on to section 34, which is safety and security. And Kelly, who is online, is going to give us a few points about that. Hi, guys. Um, on the safety and security section, it's kind of dry, but one of the things that we are uh, shooting for on that is, I don't know if you guys remember, but middle of 2018, um, was the FAA Reauth Act, and that was one of the most comprehensive aviation reauthorization me measures that was enacted in like 30 plus years. And where that hits home with us is there's actually provision in there for flight attendants at commercial airlines to have a fatigue risk management program. And we've all looked through this bid packet. It's kind of poopy. There's it's full of fatigue in there. Um, so what we're what we're wanting to secure under this section is we want to get a seat at that table. Um, we're, we're a stakeholder in this. Um, we want to have and be a part of that discussion on how to minimize fatigue through our normal scheduled operations, through like allocations, um, things like that, as well as is when we go and off schedule it. Um, operations. So when we start seeing those ear ops and stuff like that, we really need to be at that table working with the company to figure out how to minimize our risk and how to make this a safer job because we are safety professionals at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. OK, we're moving on to section 37, which is general. And Sarah Corgan is going to walk us through a few key points there. OK, so um, Based on the flight attendant feedback, one of the things that we are seeing uh, is important to the flight attendant is the guaranteed use of the flight attendant jump seat regardless of weight and balance. This is a really important issue, I know. Uh, Sarah, you know, does United or Delta take their flight attendants off the jump seat for weight and balance? Delta and United do not remove their flight attendants from the jump seat due to weight and balance. We are the largest carrier that does this. Not right. Not right. Um, and two, there's two other things that um, come up quite often in the feedback, and it falls under the commuter policy. Um, we'd like to add that um, to include the offline carriers as part of a qualifier under the commuter policy. And we also want to look at adding that if at 24 hours prior to departure, when you check in, if there are enough seats for you to be awarded a, a seat, that that would also be a qualifier under the commuter policy. Um, we think that if we add these changes that we can bring the American commuter policy um, up to our competitors. Yes. 
we've seen a lot of issues with that the last year with uh, the removal of the change fee. Mm -hmm. And where flight attendants, you know, the night before it looked fine, and then they show up that day, and then they've got, you know, 20 revenue standbys there because there's no change fees any longer. It's been a really big issue for us this year. Okay. So we really need that policy updated. Okay, we're going to move on to section 38, which is crew rest, and Wendy Oswald is going to update us on that. Thanks, Julie. Um, Section 38, crew rest, we are proposing to have all flights over seven hours have designated crew rest seats if there are no bunks ava available. Also to remove the international designation to crew rest so that it would apply to flights, domestic flights over seven hours. Um, in this section with those changes, we'll be updating the charts chart that uh, list the aircraft. And we'll be adding uh, rest for the 321 XLR that is currently um, being designed, and that will be added once it's put online. Yes, we're just in discussions with that right yeah. now. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. We have uh, 12 open sections, and we did not go through every section that is on the list right now. We will make sure to update you either through a hotline or through another town hall on the rest of the sections when we have more information for you on that. Okay, uh, next up we wanted to inform you that we will be sending out a survey. We're hoping to get that out by the end of this week, if not early next week. And it's really important that everyone uh, fills out the survey, that you, it's another part of us, you're part of all of this, letting us know what's important to you. So you please be watching for that. A hotline will go out and um, it'll tell you exactly where to go to fill that survey out. We're gonna move over to our contract action team and that is Dev Volpe and Ankit Patel and they're gonna talk to us a little bit about uh, what they're doing. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for um, signing on to the town hall. This is really important information. I'm Deborah Volpe, based in Philadelphia, starting my 35th year in a couple weeks. Contract action team. Uh, the word action is really the catalyst for everything that we're going to do here. So the contract action team really is going to be all of us. And I know that sounds like a canned thing, but as Joe said earlier, they need us to get this contract. It's one thing to have, you know, a handful of people, your representatives in there. But what happens when you can maybe virtually bring in 27,000 flight attendants? Well, that's what we're going to do with contract action. So this we have three, three categories of flight attendants at American Airlines. We have our most senior people, and chances are this may be their last agreement prior to retiring. Then we have our flight tents in the middle that are not ready to retire and know that we need another contract, a good contract. And then we have our new generation flight attendants. And for new generation, you got hired near the merger and you have not had real experience with this whole section six thing or voting on an agreement. So contract action is everybody. And it's really easy to be involved. The first thing you do is make sure you're signed up for those hotlines. That is absolutely critical. If you're reading those hotlines, you are more than halfway there. The other thing, when we start planning these events, like we launched, we just launched this email campaign like a few minutes ago. By filling out that link, that email, you are participating in our first action. And it's really important that we talk about that. We talk about it in ops, on the crew, on the crew van, on the jump seat, in the galley, of course, out of passenger earshot, um, in the terminals. And we talk it up because they need us to get this agreement. Now, as we make, as we build momentum, we want you to think about a staircase with 20 steps. We're not gonna take you up to the 20th step right now. We're all gonna go up a little bit at a time and build that momentum and build it and build it and build it. Smaller actions, maybe base actions, possibly regional actions, most definitely system-wide actions, and definitely, most definitely, linking arms with other unions at American Airlines and doing things together. Here's the reality. For those of you that are sport-minded, we are gonna be that six person off the bench going into negotiations. We're just not physically going in the room, but our actions go in the room with, this, with our negotiating committee. So we have to pull each other in. And I know sometimes we're, we're busy. We have horrible schedules right now, 
We're absolutely exhausted. We're dealing with the pandemic. But at the end of the day, this is our profession. This is our contract and we cannot allow management to drive it. We get to drive it. We have that power and we can do all of this together. Now we're going to have a couple of uh, approaches to this and one of them is going to be a digital approach, which Ankit's going to talk about in just a second. We definitely have a video that's ready to go on section six negotiations. We'll have that available for you. Um, it, we'll probably be doing some other things. Now here's the other criticism we sort of got a couple days ago from someone. They're like, you're telling management exactly what our plan is. And our response is exactly. They will know exactly how we're coming at them. Because when our negotiating committee comes to us and says, we, are, we need your help on a certain issue, it is gonna be our job to encourage management and bring management along with us. So they know what our issues are and we they come to an agreement. Anke, would you want to talk about the digital campaign? Hello everyone, uh, Anke Patel again, uh, DFW Bank, uh, Life Tenant. Uh, digital campaign will include um, creating a momentum and a, a form of engagement online. So one of the first action you're seeing today uh, is part of the digital campaign is to starting with the email. Another thing we'll be doing is creating more content that is more informative and engaging so that way everyone is more involved uh, as the negotiation process uh, evolves and moves into the next phase. Um, other thing is we'll need your help um, when we do these virtual events or in-person events. We'll need your help and your input on what direction you want us to move forward with. Um, and be more involved. And part of the involvement is also to sign up uh, for uh, the contract action team. And one of the ways to do that is to go on to APFA.org slash negotiations and click on the sign up for the contract action team. And that way you'll be more involved with it, every process or every step of the way as we move along. Thank you, Ankit. Also, you can go onto the website and you can go to the negotiating committee. And on there, which is what we're showing on the screen today, uh, you can click on the link that says sign up for the contract action team and you'll get signed up for that. Deb, do you have anything else? Just one other thing. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, the best thing to do if you don't know what's going on and don't get involved in the rumor mill, there's always an answer out there. So if you have a question and you're not sure, you can contact us by simple email address. It's action at APFA.org. Remember, management, management doesn't want us having a lot of that information because if we're, if we're divided, if we're beating each other up figuratively here, um, that helps them. So the best offense we have is the information and making sure that our coworkers have that information moving forward and participating. Perfect. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Ankit, for all your work. Uh, we'll have a lot more work going forward. Um, it looks like our flight attendants are ready for this because we know that the emails are already being sent. So thank you for those of you who have already clicked the link and sent the email off to David Seymour. Please, again, let the other flight attendants know that you're working with um, your friends anywhere to go ahead and please send the email off to David Seymour and let the company know how we deserve the rest um, that we need on our layovers. Well, that pretty much wraps it up for us today. We want to thank all of you for joining us today. It's really important you stay informed and you stay engaged. Next, we will be back at the table next week and we will make sure to send out a hotline letting you know how that went and our progress. And we'll make sure to have more of these town halls so we can let you know where we're at and more information about each of the sections that we're working on. Thank, thank you for joining us today and please fly safe. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.